Good evening. I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the March uh, California Colloquium on Water. And my name is Linda Vita. I'm the director of the Water Resources Center Archives. We're the major sponsor of this event, um, including um, our sponsors who give us financial support. And also, I want to also acknowledge the, the Colloquium Committee, which is a committee of faculty who advisors who um, select the speakers for the series. And um, as usual, I think I want to make a few of my standard announcements. We do have some brochures in the back, the water brochure, water archives, also the colloquium, and um, an email sign-up list if you are not currently getting a reminder email about one week prior to the lecture, please sign the email list. We also have a blog, which is called On Water, and do we have slips in the back? Yes. There are slips in the back if you're interested in signing up for that. And um, we also do videotape each lecture so that if you know someone who is disappointed that they could not attend, um, the lectures are posted on our website about, or a link to the video is posted on our website about a week or two after the lecture. And with that, I'd like to introduce Professor Joe Sachs, who uh, will introduce our speaker tonight. Thanks, Linda. Um, I'm Joe Sachs from the law school at uh, Bolt Hall here on campus. And it is a distinct delight to be able to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, Buzz Thompson. Uh, he is, as you know from the brochure you've seen, uh, a distinguished professor at the Stanford Law School and the director of the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford. Uh, I know him uh, for many reasons, one of which is that he and I collaborate on a water law book. Um, and uh, he is, among other things, uh, a prolific author uh, of work in the uh, water field and the environmental field. Uh, everything he writes is knowledgeable, thoughtful, interesting, original, and provocative in the best sense of the word. Uh, it, it is a, a, a delight and an honor that he's here with us tonight. And uh, I won't take any more of his time away uh, except to introduce him and to thank him for coming. Buzz? Okay, well, it's my pleasure to, uh, to be here uh, this evening and have an opportunity to uh, share uh, the next hour and a half uh, or so with you. Uh, and what I want to focus on tonight is the protection of uh, watersheds. But I want to use the protection of watersheds as really an opportunity to think in a little bit more detail uh, about what the value of the concept of ecosystem services is uh, in the policy world. What is the value of the concept of ecosystem services uh, to the uh, uh, protection uh, of, uh, uh, of watersheds? Uh, so one of the things that ecologists over the last 10 to 15 years has emphasized uh, is that the protection and the conservation of uh, lands uh, provide a variety of valuable environmental or uh, ecological uh, services. Uh, and I've put up on the screen here the obvious ones for, uh, uh, for watersheds. Uh, and watersheds are a particularly useful area in which to think about what is the potential value of, again, this concept uh, of ecosystem services. Because if you were to list uh, the ecosystem services that we receive from uh, uh, land uh, anywhere in, uh, uh, in the world, uh, my guess is, is that the most valuable ecosystem services generally will be found in watersheds from an economic uh, standpoint. Uh, and uh, that frequently the ecosystem services uh, that people are most likely to be willing to uh, pay for uh, would be found uh, in watersheds. Uh, so it's a nice place, again, to think about this question because if you can't find a value uh, to thinking in terms of ecosystem services in the watershed context, uh, then maybe there isn't much value at all 
uh, to thinking in terms of, uh, uh, of ecosystem uh, services. And of course, for years, we did not think at least uh, in the very highly defined concept of ecosystem services when we were thinking about watersheds. Uh, and yet we have long had uh, laws protecting uh, watersheds. Um, uh, the Clean Water Act has long protected watersheds. We've long had uh, watershed uh, management protection uh, entities uh, around the United States. Uh, and so again, the interesting question becomes, is there anything that adding in to our traditional uh, discourse about watersheds, uh, these specific watershed or ecosystem services uh, actually uh, gains us. Uh, and what I want to talk about and then sort of investigate some ideas in each of these various contexts uh, is at least three ways uh, in which thinking in terms of ecosystem services uh, might be valuable uh, for watershed protection. Uh, and when I talk to at least the ecologists around Stanford, people like, um, uh, say, Gretchen Daly or Hal Mooney, uh, I frequently find that uh, these are some of the points that they emphasize, although they don't necessarily use the exact same uh, terminology. Uh, so one potential value, uh, thinking in terms of ecosystem services, is that it might provide us with additional uh, uh, regulatory justification uh, for management or regulation of, uh, uh, of wetlands. Uh, that somebody who uh, has not been convinced in the past uh, that we should protect uh, uh, our watersheds, if you actually point out to them the valuable uh, services that we receive from, uh, from wetlands, uh, that they will finally actually uh, agree with you uh, that we should be regulating in this particular uh, area. A second possibility uh, is, uh, uh, and I'm using this terminology uh, uh, relatively broadly here, uh, that thinking in terms of ecosystem services can change what people think of as a public good into a uh, uh, private good. Uh, so I've sometimes, for example, heard Gretchen Daly, uh, who's an ecologist at Stanford University, uh, talk about the fact that uh, for years people have conserved land or they've protected watersheds because it is the right thing to, uh, uh, to do. Uh, that is environmentally the beneficial thing to do, but that what we really want is for people not to be thinking about protecting land or protecting watersheds because it's the right thing to do, uh, but to do it because it is something that economically uh, benefits uh, them. Uh, and I think what she's suggesting there is that we actually can change what people have historically thought of as a public good. You protect watersheds because of the general public benefits uh, into a private good that actually might uh, be the subject uh, of market investments where you can get the people who are benefiting from those uh, ecosystem services uh, to pay uh, for the watershed uh, protection. Uh, and then the uh, last uh, way in which uh, this highly defined notion of an ecosystem service could be beneficial is that it could actually help you to define and monitor uh, the protective measures, uh, that rather than thinking generally in terms of protecting wetlands, um, that what it permits you to do is to actually say what are the qualities of wetlands that you are trying to uh, protect, and then gives you a mechanism for measuring whether or not the particular system that you have in place uh, is effective uh, in getting you those particular uh, uh, benefits. The work that I'm going to be talking about here really draws uh, on three different uh, uh, projects. And so one of the things I think you'll also find is that this is a somewhat eclectic talk. I'm going to be talking about a variety of different uh, points here. Uh, but my work in three different areas, one is for EPA Science Advisory Board, uh, where I'm chairing the Committee on Valuation of Ecological Systems and Services. Uh, uh, committee has been going for about three or four years now. We'll actually be uh, releasing our report in a couple of months. Uh, in both a scientific and a lay version. Uh, a project that Sandra Postel and I did about three uh, years ago now uh, that looked at watershed protection in the United States uh, and uh, globally, and there's one publication so far out of uh, that particular project. And then finally, the Natural Capital Project at uh, uh, Stanford University, uh, which is a project uh, designed to develop new tools 
uh, for utilizing uh, the concept of ecosystem services to promote uh, land conservation, and then actually applying those tools along with the Nature Conservancy and the World Wildlife Fund in a variety of demonstration sites uh, around the, uh, uh, around the uh, globe. So with that as background, let me launch into, as I said, what I thought was sort of the first uh, reason why this concept of ecosystem services might be valuable, which is to provide additional regulatory uh, uh, justification. Uh, this is the reason why EPA was interested in creating the committee that I'm chairing uh, on the valuation of ecological systems and services. Uh, as probably most of you in this room know, uh, whenever EPA engages in a major national rulemaking, they have to engage in a regulatory uh, impact assessment. As part of that regulatory impact assessment, they have to look uh, at the comparative costs and benefits uh, of the regulations uh, that they pass. And one of the things that EPA has found is that uh, although historically they've been able to do a fairly good job of evaluating the health benefits uh, of uh, uh, their various uh, uh, regulatory measures, uh, that they have not been able to do a particularly effective job of evaluating the ecological uh, benefits uh, of the regulations uh, that they pass. A good example of that is uh, uh, EPA's CAFO regulations that they promulgated uh, several years ago. They were able to do a very good job of actually looking to see what the health benefits would be and then putting an economic value on those health benefits. But when they got to the ecological benefits, with one or two minor exceptions, what they ultimately concluded was there are all these various benefits. We don't know how to uh, uh, quantify them or to value them in economic terms. Uh, and therefore, uh, all we can say is that there's some unspecified ecological benefits to passing this particular regulation, uh, which they demarked as a plus B, uh, so that when uh, their cost-benefit analysis went to the Office of Management and Budget uh, and then was publicized, you had a large number for the health benefits uh, with a plus B uh, at the uh, uh, end of it, uh, and that was then to be used to compare to the uh, cost. Now, in the CAFO analysis, thankfully, the health benefits actually outweighed the, uh, the cost. But you could readily imagine a variety of regulations, and this is what worries EPA, where if you just look at the health benefits, but you can't monetize uh, the uh, ecological benefits, that the cost-benefit analysis, which will uh, be used by OMB frequently to fight back against regulations, which will then be publicized, uh, will not look as if the regulation uh, is actually uh, one uh, which is cost beneficial uh, to pass. Uh, you also are finding a variety of uh, regional uh, agencies uh, that are also very interested in trying to value the ecological benefits of various management measures, and again, uh, to help justify the, um, uh, the particular uh, management measure. Uh, so for example, the city of Portland's watershed management uh, program uh, about uh, two or three years ago did a major study uh, of the restoration of the Johnson Creek uh, watershed in the Lentz area of uh, Portland to see whether or not the management measures, again, could be justified uh, to uh, the politicians uh, as something which would actually be uh, uh, cost justified. So this idea of ecosystem services uh, perhaps provides you with a mechanism uh, to actually determine an ecological value uh, for uh, the uh, uh, watershed protection, which if your EPA gives you better justification before Congress, uh, if you're the Portland uh, watershed management program uh, gives you better justification when you go to the city council uh, to justify a, um, uh, a particular uh, measure. Um, and in fact, you know, there is uh, uh, various studies that have been done uh, that suggest that you can frequently get very high values uh, for uh, uh, ecosystem services in watersheds and help justify uh, particular measures. Uh, so this is a slide that uh, Walter uh, uh, Reed provided uh, to me. It's out of the Millennium uh, Ecosystem uh, Assessment. Uh, one of the things that they looked at uh, was in uh, forests in Italy. Question is, 
what's the value of actually protecting uh, those uh, uh, forests. Uh, and what you see when uh, you try at least to put a simple economic value on it is that the value of cutting it down uh, for uh, uh, timber and uh, uh, fuel wood is actually considerably less uh, than the value that you can put on the actual watershed protection because of the various ecosystem services uh, that you get out of that uh, uh, watershed uh, protection. So this is simply uh, 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 at a, a very uh, fundamental and basic level, uh, the, you know, the type of case that, again, EPA uh, or Portland watershed managers would like to be able to, uh, uh, to make. Uh, it isn't always uh, true. Uh, so they also looked at forests in uh, Croatia, uh, and there what they found was that if you look uh, at uh, uh, various ecosystem services from carbon sequestration to the sort of bundle of services that you get out of watershed protection, you're still much less than the value of actually cutting it down. So it doesn't mean you're always going to come up uh, with a value which justifies a particular environmental measure that you would like to, uh, to take. But again, it gets you further along the road uh, than just being able to, uh, uh, to measure uh, the, uh, uh, the health benefits. Uh, there's several problems, though, uh, in using ecosystem services at the moment to get you that additional uh, justification. At least if you want that justification uh, in quantitative uh, uh, terms. Um, the first one is on the, uh, uh, on the ecological uh, side. Uh, and on the ecological side, one of the problems right now is that uh, we do not have, uh, for many of the services, uh, fully defined <coughs> ecological production functions. Uh, what you would really like to have uh, is the ability, given particular inputs, given particular uh, agency actions of protecting, for example, a particular watershed, you would like to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, determine uh, exactly what services uh, you're getting out of that, uh, and services that people actually uh, care about, that you can actually ask them, how important is this, how valuable is it? So particular levels of water quality, uh, particular levels of hydroelectric uh, flows, uh, reduced downstream flood risk. Uh, historically, however, most ecological uh, uh, models instead produce uh, measures of various outputs such as uh, uh, habitable uh, uh, space, uh, species biodiversity, which are not things that uh, economists uh, can readily uh, value because they are not the ultimate services uh, which are uh, uh, consumed uh, by uh, uh, society. Um, instead, they are one step still removed uh, from uh, the services uh, that you would like to be able to quantify uh, and, uh, uh, and then value. So in the same way as economists uh, you know, like to have economic production functions so that you know, depending on what inputs you put into a particular business process, what output you're going to get, you would also like to have ecological uh, production functions. Uh, and again, although we have a growing number of models that are in this space, we don't have very many models that actually go all the way out there. Uh, furthermore, the models that we actually have um, generally need to be parameterized uh, for uh, a local watershed. You need data from the local watershed in order to effectively use those models there. Uh, that turns out to be a very uh, uh, costly process. Now, we're beginning to see uh, ecologists moving in the direction of providing uh, uh, models and tools uh, that can help us to uh, uh, get some sense, uh, given particular management measures, what the uh, uh, ecological effects uh, in terms of ecosystem services uh, are actually likely to, uh, to be. Uh, so this is an example from the uh, Natural Capital Project. Uh, one of the areas that uh, we've been working in the Natural Capital Project is to develop a tool, the INVEST tool, uh, that you can actually uh, uh, utilize uh, given uh, some basic data that should be available in, for example, most regions of the United States to actually determine based on various scenarios what the impact is going to be on the ecosystem services uh, in a uh, uh, particular uh, uh, watershed. And one area that uh, the researchers have been working uh, is in the Willamette Valley in Oregon 
where thankfully we have a fair amount of data. We also have very engaged um, uh, interest groups that are interested in the question of given uh, various scenarios. Uh, one is a 2050 scenario uh, that basically takes current trends. One is a 2050 uh, uh, scenario which assumes that you actually develop more property uh, than the current trend would suggest, but still a realistic amount uh, of development. Uh, and a 2050 scenario where you actually engage in more conservation. What is the impact on uh, ecosystem uh, uh, services? And again, taking some very simple uh, algorithms, uh, what they've been uh, able to, uh, uh, to do is taking each of the three scenarios, the 2050 just trend line, 2050 more development, 2050 conservation. They've been able to go across with some basic uh, ecosystem services of water uh, quality, uh, management of storm peaks, carbon sequestration, uh, biodiversity, uh, and actually uh, determine for each of those scenarios for various parcels of land within the Willamette Valley whether or not you're likely to gain more or less uh, of each of the uh, uh, various uh, services. Uh, and then you're also able to, again, using some relatively uh, simple algorithms, uh, take a market value and uh, look to see for various parcels of land uh, how uh, the services and the value of those services uh, is actually likely to, well, uh, to change. Uh, and this is simply uh, uh, graphical uh, versions uh, of the same information, again showing for the different trend lines of the, uh, uh, of the uh, current trend, development and conservation, how things would change over the next 50 years in terms of the total amount uh, of various services uh, ranging again from, uh, uh, from water quality uh, to management of storm peaks. So ecologists are beginning uh, to develop tools that can be utilized in this area uh, to gain uh, the biophysical information uh, of what is the impact going to be of particular scenarios. You can imagine this also particular EPA regulations or particular management measures by the city of, uh, of Portland. What's going to be the impact on these services which are directly valued by uh, the public? So we're beginning to see some progress here, but we need significant uh, uh, more progress. The other thing which I want to just spend uh, a few minutes uh, uh, talking about, sort of throwing out uh, uh, some questions, um, is, okay, once you actually know, in biophysical terms, uh, what the impact is going to be on a particular service, maybe it's water quality, maybe it's uh, 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 peak uh, uh, flood flows, um, you then, if you're EPA, want to actually value uh, those particular changes uh, in your ecosystem uh, uh, services. Uh, how do you go about doing that? Well, the uh, dominant methodology historically has been uh, economics. Uh, the law for, uh, uh, for regulatory impact assessments actually requires you uh, to use economics. So both the executive order that requires EPA to engage in these cost-benefit analyses uh, and also the OMB circular uh, that fleshes out uh, that executive order uh, requires uh, economics uh, to, well, uh, to be used. Uh, and there are good reasons uh, to think in um, uh, economic terms. Um, it's a well-developed uh, theory. Uh, unlike a variety of other measures of value that we've thought about using uh, on the EPA committee, which I've mentioned uh, earlier, uh, because you're dealing with a common currency, it's also fairly easy to measure uh, and to compare uh, costs uh, and benefits. Um, but there's a variety of uh, uh, potential problems uh, in trying to attach an economic value to your biophysical measures of the changes in, uh, uh, in ecosystem uh, services. Um, I won't go through all of the ones that are listed on this particular uh, uh, slide, uh, except let me just mention uh, two uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the moment, because I want to come back and talk about these in a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, one is the problem that it's frequently difficult to actually put economic value on some of these uh, uh, services, particularly those services that are not traded 
uh, and, uh, uh, and not used. Uh, and then a point which I really want to emphasize and come back and, and see if I can provoke a little bit of discussion uh, after my talk on, which is the question of whether or not what we should be trying to well, uh, uh, actually obtain here is a private value uh, or, a, uh, uh, or a public uh, value. Um, and those can be quite different. I'm going to come back uh, and flesh out a little bit more uh, what I mean by uh, uh, private value uh, versus uh, uh, public value. But let me just walk through the, uh, uh, the typical economic mechanisms that we can use to try to put a value on changes in these ecosystem uh, services and talk about some of the problems that you get into uh, in uh, the economic valuation context. Uh, so the ideal thing would be if you actually could uh, uh, find uh, market prices uh, for the various uh, ecosystem services. And to, for, to the degree, for example, uh, that your ecosystem service that you're looking at uh, is promotion of uh, fish harvest uh, or it's uh, uh, pollination for crops, uh, then you might actually be able to get uh, a market price that you could attach uh, to the changes in those particular services that you get out of protecting a particular uh, watershed. But recognize that this is uh, uh, largely the exception, uh, that most of the ecosystem services that we're talking about probably will not have uh, a direct uh, market uh, value attached to it. So to the degree that we don't have a market value, um, uh, but to the degree that these are actually um, uh, utilized, we can sometimes look to uh, various revealed preferences. Uh, and economists have a variety of, uh, uh, of methods, travel costs, hedonic pricing, averting behavior, to actually try to see uh, the value that people put uh, on uh, particular uh, 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 services uh, or, uh, or goods. Uh, here again, uh, however, there's a variety of, uh, uh, of problems, uh, including the fact that there's actually few really usable studies uh, that we can turn to to put a value on uh, these various uh, ecosystem uh, services. So there's only sort of a small set of ecosystem services uh, for which we can find uh, revealed uh, preferences. Um, and so the other uh, major alternative here is stated preferences, where you basically ask people how much they value uh, a change in a particular uh, ecosystem service. Uh, so the most common form uh, of a stated preference is a contingent valuation method, where again, you ask people uh, how much they would actually uh, uh, value uh, the protection of, for example, a particular uh, endangered species providing habitat uh, for that particular uh, uh, endangered uh, species. Um, and um, here there's some potential advantages that we don't have with some of the other methods. In particular, this is one that you could apply uh, in virtually uh, every setting, uh, so it's broadly uh, uh, applicable. Um, but again, uh, there's a variety of problems uh, with going out and doing the uh, surveys, ranging from the fact that you are asking hypothetical questions of people, so you don't know whether you're getting the, uh, uh, the full information, um, to the fact that you're not sure how well informed the respondents are, how readily they can value something that they're not used to valuing, because this is not something that will be valued in the market. You generally don't value uh, habitat for butterflies in the market. Uh, to the fact that this is, again, an extremely costly and time-consuming process of going out and actually surveying people to figure out what the value of this improvement that you might get in a particular ecosystem service is. Uh, and the Office of Management and Budget, at the same time that they are uh, requiring EPA to engage in cost-benefit uh, analyses, actually restricts EPA's ability to conduct these types of surveys uh, and new studies. Uh, in order to reduce paperwork uh, and inconvenience to the American public, uh, the Office of Management and Budget uh, generally restricts EPA's ability to actually engage in the type of studies that you would need uh, to uh, determine uh, the, um, uh, the stated uh, preference. So one of the things that we've done uh, on, uh, uh, on the EPA committee, which I've been chairing, um, is that uh, uh, we have looked to see, in addition to sort of the traditional methods of finding out people's revealed preferences, 
uh, for protecting uh, a watershed and the services that come out of that. Uh, something like, again, the travel cost method. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to the traditional way of uh, gaining stated preferences, asking people how much uh, they value the particular protection, through economic surveys, what other sources are there of learning about people's revealed preferences or, or asking people uh, what their preferences uh, are? And we've come up with a fairly uh, 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 long list of other ways in which you might be able to, uh, uh, again, get the population to reveal their preferences or to ask them about their uh, preferences. And I want to focus in on two of them because it gets me back to the question which I raised earlier about whether or not uh, we want people's private valuation uh, or their public valuation. So on the left-hand side, on revealed preferences, one potential source uh, of uh, revealed preference, of which there is some economic research that has been done, uh, is looking at referenda uh, and, um, uh, and initiatives. Uh, and so the idea here is uh, that in the same way as you might look at people's behavior uh, to determine uh, how much they uh, uh, value uh, a particular environmental amenity, by looking to see, for example, how much they will pay extra for a house because it happens to be right next to uh, a beautiful lake. Can we use referenda and initiative results uh, from uh, around the United States to get a sense of how much people value uh, protecting wetlands uh, or various other forms of, uh, uh, of uh, conservation? And the idea here is, is that every time we hold a referendum and initiative, <laughs> Uh, say in a local jurisdiction in California, if you're a voter in the local jurisdiction, what we are really doing is asking you how much you value the particular conservation that we propose to do uh, within that particular uh, initiative. And when you vote in favor or against that initiative, we are getting information uh, on uh, the, uh, on your valuation. And one of the great things, if we can use uh, initiatives, uh, is that there are a lot of them out there that we can actually study. So just in that 10-year period of time from 1996, uh, you had you know, something in the nature of close to 1,500 votes on initiatives that you can draw on on beginning to get some sense of how much people actually value uh, the type of conservation which is proposed under those uh, local uh, initiatives. Now, what I find particularly interesting when you think about the idea of using initiatives uh, to uh, value uh, conservation is that it's a very different type of value uh, than we think about when we talk about the value that people put on uh, uh, groceries uh, that they buy uh, at a, um, uh, a store. Uh, the first thing is, is that we're, when people go out and they vote for initiatives, you're not generally evaluating the initiative as a consumer. You might uh, be thinking about just, you know, what's the pure benefit to me? But most of the time, uh, you're valuing it as a member of the public. Uh, you're asking the question of whether or not the total cost of the initiative in terms of the bonds that would have to be issued, uh, whether or not uh, those bonds that you ultimately are gonna have to pay for uh, are worth it to the public to get the particular conservation that would be paid for uh, with the benefits of those particular uh, bonds. So rather than thinking in terms of your own private utility, um, what you are frequently thinking of is in a much more public regarded uh, fashion. Um, and so at the very outset, you're asking people to put a value on conservation in a very different way uh, than we are through various other uh, uh, economic valuation techniques. You're still getting a monetary value, but it's a very different monetary value than traditional economic techniques. Uh, note also that when you're looking at initiatives, what you're doing is uh, using a different rule for determining what the value of something is. Um, generally, when we uh, look for the value of a, uh, a particular good or service, and we use a traditional economic approach, what we're doing is we're taking each person's individual value and then adding them up. We're taking an additive approach. Uh, in the case of initiatives, on the other hand, 
we have a very different rule for determining value. Rather than saying we're going to add everyone's value, instead what we're going to look at is what the median person uh, thinks uh, that, the, um, uh, that the value uh, is. Um, and so, again, what you're looking at is whether or not half of the voting population thinks something is worth a particular value, uh, rather than, again, just adding everything up. And one particular point to note here is that as a result of that, it really doesn't consider the intensity of individual preferences. Everybody gets one vote uh, in an initiative. Uh, and so unlike traditional economic valuation, where if you happen to well, have a very strong preference uh, and put a high value on something, that ends up uh, influencing the final value. Here, uh, you're again, I'm just a one person, one vote. So all you care about uh, is, the, um, uh, is the median uh, voter. Um, so you're coming up with a value. You're coming up with uh, a value in monetary terms. But again, it's a public value measured by a very different theoretical rule than you do uh, for, uh, for economic uh, valuation. Uh, now, there's a whole variety of problems that people have raised about using uh, initiatives uh, to actually try to determine the value that people put on, for example, the conservation uh, of, a, um, uh, of a, um, uh, a watershed. Uh, and um, I'll be happy to talk about during questions, but for the moment I'm just going to say there's a variety of problems uh, that you can uh, uh, run into. I'm not sure that they're that serious uh, of, uh, of problems, but because of that, uh, we also have spent some time on uh, the EPA committee uh, looking at another potential stated preference approach, which is rather than going out and asking individuals, how much do you value the protection of habitat for uh, say, a particular uh, uh, butterfly, and then adding up uh, what people's uh, values are uh, using uh, the concept of a citizen valuation uh, jury. Uh, so the idea here would be that if you can do your ecological uh, modeling and actually determine how the protection or management of a particular watershed uh, will affect uh, the ecosystem services uh, that you get out of that watershed, what about then uh, organizing a, um, a jury, much like a grand uh, jury? You could imagine a group of 20 people, or you could imagine all the people in this room. Uh, we select you to try to reflect the diversity uh, of, the, um, uh, of the political group uh, that is making a decision as to whether or not to go forward with a particular uh, measure. Uh, and then we ask you, uh, in a deliberative process, to come up with what you think uh, the value is of the particular uh, uh, watershed protection uh, or uh, uh, watershed uh, management technique. And there's actually a potential uh, variety of advantages of organizing these type of citizen juries uh, to determine what the value of uh, watershed management is versus uh, looking at the initiative process from the fact that you don't have to wait for initiatives uh, to be held. You can hold this on any type of valuation question. You have better control over the representation. You can actually control uh, who's on your jury, unlike who votes, uh, although you do have a problem that frequently these are small sizes and therefore you might uh, uh, get somewhat inconsistent results. You can give the people on your jury complete information whereas voters frequently don't have very good information about what they're voting on. Uh, it's probably a more deliberative process uh, than you find in referenda and initiatives. I don't tend to think very carefully about the initiatives I vote on uh, before I, uh, I, I vote on them, maybe because that's because I'm Palo Alto rather than Berkeley, but I actually don't spend as much time actually engaged uh, in uh, the democratic process as I probably should, uh, the citizen juries, you can make them very reflective. Um, I actually think in some ways it's more likely to generate a public valuation because you can actually tell them what we want you to do is to put a public value uh, on this particular uh, measure, where some people when they're voting might actually think more in terms of private valuation. Um, and importantly, if the whole purpose of, again, sort of playing off of this idea of ecosystem services is to increase uh, the justification for particular measures, having these type of citizen juries where all of us actually 
uh, would be required to serve at various points in time to help come up with valuations, increases the opportunity for citizen involvement uh, and uh, education. Now, what's interesting, I think, about both the idea of using referenda and the idea of citizen juries is, again, this notion that when we value things, we can think of ourselves along a spectrum from a pure consumer who's just putting a private value uh, on uh, the protection of a wetland and the increase, hopefully, in the services that you get from that particular protection, uh, to acting in a pure citizen's role. Uh, where uh, uh, what we are uh, uh, doing is actually thinking in our role of a citizen uh, of what uh, the value of a particular protective measure should be. And there's actually some uh, empirical evidence, not a great deal right now. This is an area where I think uh, that it would be useful to do some more work. There's a fair amount of empirical evidence that if you put people, consciously try to put people uh, somewhere on this spectrum. Tell them we want them to value something as a consumer of a good or to value something as, um, uh, as a citizen. Uh, that when you put them over here on the pure citizen side, uh, that they come up with higher values for public goods. Uh, and interestingly enough, amongst public goods, uh, appear to get the greatest effect uh, when you ask them about the value of, um, uh, of an environmental good. Now, there's two things that are interesting here. First is you actually get different answers, depending on how you situate somebody and tell them the terms in which they're supposed to value something. Uh, and then second of all is the interesting thing that you, know, you could imagine that people would be sort of randomly distributed, and sometimes they would come up with higher values when they're pure consumers, other times when they're pure citizens. But when we're talking about environmental goods, uh, the consistency seems to be that people come up with higher values uh, when they're in the role of pure citizen. I'll, I'll take your question in a moment. But one of the interesting questions here, and again, something we need to investigate even more, is why you end up with different valuations uh, here. Uh, and some possibilities are that you actually uh, differ in the type of information you consider, depending on whether or not you think you're valuing something as a citizen or in your own private realm. The level of deliberativeness uh, we get, whether or not people actually spend more time thinking about something and deliberating if they think they're acting on behalf of the public rather than just on uh, behalf of themselves as a consumer. Uh, and then also this sort of question of whether or not there's uh, a concept of sort of other regardedness uh, that leads us uh, when we think broadly about the benefit of this to society and not just to ourselves. Uh, then we actually put a higher value uh, on things. So that's just the first third of my uh, uh, presentation. I want to get to the other two thirds, and I'll be even faster on those. Uh, but any questions along the way, feel free to ask them. Quick clarification, is this akin to a use versus non-use value distinction? Is that kind of what you're talking about? You know, I think it's actually different. Um, uh, even on, uh, you know, on uh, a use or a non-use because you, know, you could imagine, for example, um, and you, if I remember correctly on the experiments that have been done, uh, you'll find sometimes that the valuation questions that are asked uh, are about uh, various services that are actually used. Uh, for example, uh, uh, recreation uh, or uh, 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 and also sometimes, though, non-use uh, uh, values uh, such as, say, habitat uh, for, uh, uh, for an endangered uh, butterfly. Uh, and again, you still get this difference depending on whether or not uh, you're actually asking people to value something in the role of the consumer versus in the uh, uh, role uh, of a uh, citizen. Yeah? On the initiative uh, evaluation, yeah. um, you talked about this median issue there. You're just getting sort of the median value. What's the research saying about how you can strip out from the overall value of the bond to buy a piece of land, for example, and how you apportion that to the different services that that land is going to provide? And yeah. Is there any research about how to do that? Uh, so uh, the answer is no. Uh, and another advantage to thinking in terms of the citizen jury versus the um, uh, initiative is that in the initiative, generally what you are doing is getting a value for a total bundle, uh, for a total package uh, that's going to, uh, uh, to the voters. Uh, and so uh, it is very difficult to take the results of the initiative uh, and then figure out 
how much people might value individual elements of what that particular bond is going to be paid for. Uh, so it can be quite valuable to the degree that um, you know, the bond is going to be used to pay to protect very similar land that you would expect to get similar services from so that um, you, know, you would expect, you know, so, so you basically are talking about a relatively homogeneous package, much more difficult when you're dealing with more heterogeneous uh, packages. So that's one of the problems that I think does uh, limit your ability to use initiatives and referenda. Um, and one of the things I find attractive about this concept of, uh, uh, of citizen uh, valuation juries, where again, you can actually provide the citizens with information about exactly what service changes uh, they're going to uh, uh, be receiving uh, as a result of a particular uh, uh, management uh, measure. So let me go on now to, well, uh, to the second argument for why this concept of ecosystem services might be valuable. Uh, and that is, is that you might actually be able to get people now to privately pay uh, for a, uh, uh, to protect a particular watershed because of the valuable ecosystem services that you get out of that protective measure. And of course, the example that everyone gives uh, when they want to show the potential advantage of ecosystem services to promoting investment in conservation of watersheds uh, is New York City's uh, protection of the Catskills, whereas the story is told uh, New York City was evaluating how they were going to maintain water quality in the Catskill and Delaware watersheds. Building a filtration facility would have cost something in the nature of $6 billion. Uh, whereas actually going in and protecting the watershed uh, would have actually cost far less. And so looking at the two comparisons, uh, the city of New York uh, decided to go in and actually engage uh, in active watershed protection, including uh, purchasing uh, land in the Catskill and Delaware uh, watershed. Uh, so this is proponent of ecosystem services uh, dream. It would be nice if we could imagine that by showing people the values that they got out of watersheds, that you would have water suppliers would go in uh, and invest in the protection of the watershed, that downstream cities would go in and invest uh, in watershed protection in order to reduce downstream uh, flood risk, that hydroelectric facilities, if they were downstream, would go in in order to invest in order to get uh, a more consistent uh, flow uh, for their hydroelectric facility. And in fact, New York is not the only example uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, entities that have gone in and invested in watershed protection for the ecosystem services. Uh, there are a variety of examples in uh, uh, the United States, for example, of other cities that have gone in and invested in watershed protection because it was cheaper uh, than uh, uh, building and operating a filtration facility. So these are some of the major cities and the numbers under each of the cities uh, is uh, uh, the amount of money uh, that those cities uh, believe that they have saved as a result uh, of protecting the watershed versus having to build uh, a capital intensive uh, filtration facility. Uh, outside of uh, the United States, there are also a variety of examples. Uh, another popular one is Quito, uh, Ecuador, uh, which draws water from two protected watersheds. But even though these watersheds are protected, they're ecological reserves uh, in Ecuador, uh, there are significant threats that the government has not been doing a particularly effective job uh, of protecting against, including encroachment of uh, people uh, and agricultural operations and the cutting of timber uh, within those reserves. Uh, and so the city of, uh, uh, of Quito uh, actually established a fund uh, and uh, the Quito uh, Water Agency is paying into the fund. There's also a downstream hydroelectric facility that is paying into that uh, uh, fund. Uh, and that fund is then uh, being used to protect uh, the uh, watershed, which is hopefully producing various watershed services in terms of cleaner water and more regular flows uh, that benefit, again, uh, the water agency uh, and the electric utility. Uh, and another example that people frequently cite is Napa Valley's investment 
uh, in protection of the uh, Napa River uh, watershed. Uh, and in the case of Napa, uh, looking at ways of reducing floods, uh, costs of actually developing uh, dikes, levees, and the like, is again more than the cost of restoration of the natural floodplain. Uh, and so Napa Valley goes in and they actually invest in watershed protection. So this is the good story, right? This is the story that shows the second potential reason why ecosystem services can be a valuable concept is that you might be able to use it to actually get the people who benefit from these ecosystem services to go in and invest uh, in the protection uh, of the uh, uh, watershed. Um, but when you start taking a closer look, um, you see that the examples that are frequently raised uh, are, seem to be more exceptions than the norm. Uh, and even the examples that are given seem to be relatively limited. So I talked a moment ago about the fund that Quito Ecuador has uh, created. Uh, there's, I think, a very serious question as to whether or not that fund is actually sufficient and sustainable. Uh, what they've set up is a non-declining uh, endowment fund. So, you know, they thought, we can't just use the money as we get it. We should set up an endowment that we can use to, well, protect conservation in the long run. But note how much money is going into this endowment fund. In the case of the water utility, uh, they are directing about 1% of their revenues. It's only $14,000 a month. Uh, the hydroelectric facility is only contributing about $45,000 a year. That might be able to get you a fair amount in uh, uh, Ecuador, uh, but it's unlikely to be uh, uh, sufficient uh, in very many areas. Uh, more importantly, uh, in the uh, study that Sandra Postel and I did of watershed protection uh, about three years ago, one of the things that we did was we actually looked at what California water suppliers were, uh, uh, were doing uh, with their watershed. And we went in hoping and expecting that what we would find is, is that a number of them were doing what New York City is doing in the Catskills uh, and Delaware watersheds. We looked at all suppliers with over 50,000 uh, customers. So we tried to hit all of the major uh, water utilities. Um, and what we found was that uh, very few of them, uh, less than a handful, uh, had actually acquired any significant new land uh, in the uh, uh, last uh, decade that those acquisitions were generally very small uh, parcels of land. They weren't a lot of land. Um, and that, interestingly enough, many of them were, to the degree they actually owned watershed land, they were utilizing that land in a way which was inconsistent with protection of the watershed. So a number of them, for example, were actually engaging in logging operations in their own watershed, even though you would think that that would undercut uh, the water quality objectives of actually holding uh, that particular uh, uh, land. Uh, so what's happening here? Why are we not seeing more cities behave uh, like New York? Why, in the case of California water utilities, don't we see them uh, spending significant sums of money uh, protecting uh, their uh, uh, watersheds? Here are some of the things that we found, both in California and elsewhere. One problem gets back to this whole problem of uh, valuation. Uh, when we would talk to uh, uh, the watershed managers uh, for uh, water utilities, the people who would manage the land from which the utility was getting its water, what we would frequently have them, uh, 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 what we frequently found they told us was that if there was a piece of land that was in danger of being developed and that they thought would be worth protecting because of uh, the value of protecting that land to the water quality, uh, that they received, um, that they would go before their board of directors and they would say, we want to spend $3 million buying this land. And they would say, well, what's the value buying that land? And they would say, well, there's lots of studies out there that show to the degree you protect your watershed that that increases water quality, to which the board of directors would then say, well, how much uh, uh, would water quality decrease if we don't buy this piece of land? Uh, and they would actually want the type of valuation uh, that you would frequently expect uh, uh, business entities uh, to demand of their employees. Uh, and the watershed managers would say that they could never answer that question. And that was very different than the water quality engineers that could go in and tell the board of directors that for a set amount of money, they could build the following quality filtration facility and get exactly 
uh, uh, you know, a particular quality uh, of water. So they simply didn't have the information to, take, to actually make the type of case that they wanted to. Uh, a second problem uh, is uh, institutional divisions. Um, one problem was that uh, there were sometimes uh, questions of who would be in charge of watershed management. Uh, so sometimes we would ask the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the watershed manager for a utility, well, why don't you uh, protect your watershed uh, to a greater degree? And they would say, that's not our concern. Uh, that there's actually a conservation district in this area. And it's the conservation district uh, that handles those sort of issues. We don't have to worry about that as a water utility. We would then go to the conservation district and ask them, and they would say, well, we don't have to worry about those sort of things because that's actually something that we assume that the water utility uh, is handling. So there would frequently be problems of the way in which uh, the responsibility was divided so that everyone assumed and probably hoped uh, that the other guy uh, was handling the problem. There was also frequently an internal split between water quality managers and watershed managers. Uh, when we would talk to water utilities, what we sometimes found was that the watershed managers were the biologists uh, in the crowd. Uh, they had a lot of expertise on protection of biodiversity. Uh, and the people who were supposed to be experts in water quality uh, were in a separate section uh, of the utility. So that there actually wasn't uh, as much interplay as you would like. Uh, not surprisingly, in areas like Northern California, high cost of land would sometimes be uh, a factor. Opposition from upstream communities. Uh, one of the problems that water utilities frequently cited was that if they actually went in and tried to buy up and protect the watershed land, that the communities that were upstream in which that land was found uh, would complain that you were interfering with their development of their communities. And in fact, that was a problem that New York ran into with the Catskills, where the local communities uh, initially complained about New York City coming in and protecting the watershed because that would limit the degree to which they can engage in economic development. Uh, and then one other problem was that sometimes, even if they thought they had a value of what the uh, protecting the watershed would have on the downstream uh, water quality, uh, that that by itself would not be sufficient to justify buying the land, and that you really wanted to try to bundle together multiple benefits, flood benefit risks, water quality risks, carbon sequestration, but that frequently meant trying to pull together multiple buyers to all come together and go in on uh, a joint acquisition and management of the watershed uh, land. So uh, since when uh, Professor Sachs invited me, he probably thought I was going to talk about law uh, to at least some degree. I do need to talk briefly about how the law might actually help. Uh, in this particular area, overcome some of the burdens that we were just talking about. And let me just run through several of them. First of all, actually encouraging investment in ecosystem services, creating a baseline of environmental protection, facilitating the transactions, uh, and uh, helping to create effective market institutions. And let me just sort of run through each of those. Um, the first one is encouraging investments. Um, you, know, you would hope that water utilities would invest in the protection of the watershed because they thought it was the right thing to do. But as I told you a moment ago, frequently they're not sure it's the right thing to do. They don't have the right information uh, that they need to actually figure out the value of protecting uh, the, uh, uh, the watershed. So they might not be able to value uh, uh, the natural solution of protecting the watershed. They might want to free ride on other people like the conservation district and let the conservation district engage in the operation. They might not even realize that by letting their watershed uh, deteriorate uh, that they would lose uh, water quality. And so here is, I think, a significant role for the law. Uh, and there are a variety of uh, regulatory requirements and standards like the Safe Drinking Water Act that actually tell water utilities that they have to think about this uh, issue. And in fact, if it wasn't for the Safe Drinking Water Act, you probably wouldn't have New York's example. New York did not go out and simply say, well, we need to protect water quality, look at the cost of the filtration facility, look at the cost of watershed preservation, this is lower, so this is what we're going to do. Instead, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, there's a surface water treatment rule that basically says that if your watershed is deteriorating, and as a result of that, you're uh, losing water quality, you have to filter. You have to filter unless you protect your watershed. 
So the law forced the city of New York to confront this trade-off between protecting the ecosystem services by protecting the watershed or building a filtration uh, facility. Um, and I think frequently, wherever you see ecosystem service markets developing, whether it be in the context of watersheds or for carbon sequestration, it is generally because there is a law out there which is driving that particular market. So in the case of New York, in the case of all of those various other water utilities that I listed, all of them were confronted by this choice that the law forced them uh, to, well, uh, to make. Yeah? Sorry to interrupt that. I just want to ask you some clarification. Yeah. In, in your previous slide about the California example, you were talking about water supply agencies. And, uh, and actually, the last uh, session of this group, we had a, a director of a okay. water agency, and he told us all sorts of things that, that he was doing. And, and actually, in my experience, we've a number of water agencies around California. They're all thinking this way all the time about their resources and how to protect them. So I, I guess I wasn't sure where you're, um, if you just explain that a little bit more, uh, maybe an example of the ones that aren't uh, doing it this way in California, just to... Yeah even, yeah, even the ones, and this again is a survey three years ago, but I think it's still the case now. They might be thinking about the value of the, um, uh, of the uh, watershed, but that's very different than actually going in and making the, uh, uh, the land acquisitions uh, themselves. Uh, and so again, one of the things that we did was uh, we look to see the degree to which the water agencies are actively going in, acquiring land because of the watershed services that those lands provide. So if there's an example, say, a uh, county that was putting in conservation easements for an HCP or PG&E putting big conservation easements, was that, would that be something that was included in your, is it maybe that the water agencies don't need to do that because it's been done or someone else is doing it? Yeah, uh, so it would, it would have included not only the purchasing of the land, but it also would have included uh, the creation uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the easements uh, themselves. Now, we have had several bonds over the past couple of years that have made money specifically available uh, for acquisition of, uh, uh, of land, right? Yep. And so to the degree, and that might actually be a change, uh, sort of thinking about the timeline, it probably is. To the degree that you have a water utility which uh, can rely upon public monies uh, to make these various investments, then you don't have the, uh, uh, the problem uh, of actually having to justify the particular acquisition. Yeah. Just a quick question. Yeah. What about water agencies that may not be buying lands, but they're restoring the floodplain or restoring creeks? Is that, are those, are those uh, services or values included in what you're looking at? Because a lot of the water agencies are in the Bay or in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, so, so the one thing I should, uh, you know, should point out here is that there are a variety of agencies that may not be going in and actively purchasing land that are still taking various other steps to manage their watersheds effectively. There are some that, as I mentioned earlier, actually aren't. I mean, there are some that, uh, for financial reasons, have gone in and are actually managing the lands in ways that don't seem to be totally consistent. But I would say, uh, in answer to your question, that the vast majority of water agencies in California do manage those lands effectively. Uh, so, you know, uh, agencies like, such as San Francisco or East Bay Mud, the lands that they own, they actually, I think, manage, uh, uh, you know, very effectively. The question then simply becomes, to what degree are they uh, uh, going in uh, and uh, acquiring uh, the additional land uh, in the way that New York City did. And that survey was just looking at acquisition either of fee simples uh, or of uh, conservation uh, easements. Okay. Um, the other thing though about this surface water treatment rule uh, is it actually does not have a particularly large impact. Uh, because 97% of all water suppliers actually already uh, uh, filter uh, their water and therefore aren't specifically subject uh, to this filtration uh, rule. There are a variety of other types of incentive approaches that you can uh, uh, take. Um, and this sort of gets back again to your particular question. To the degree you actually ask uh, agencies to engage in analyses, that's another way in which the law or regulatory systems 
can encourage the water utilities to take steps to protect their watershed. And so, for example, the California drinking water source uh, analyses, uh, example of that. Uh, disclosure uh, rules, uh, certification programs. The Nature Conservancy is right now uh, working on a, uh, uh, on a program uh, uh, to actually certify watersheds. Uh, they uh, held a conference last year uh, looking at this, uh, and this would be so specifically for water utilities to be able to say that their particular watersheds uh, have uh, or are being managed uh, in a way uh, which uh, maximizes ecosystem uh, services and the other benefits uh, from that particular uh, land. Uh, financial incentives, so again, bonds fall into that particular uh, 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 category. Um, let me, and I'm just going to sort of jump through a couple of slides because I want to finish and have time for, uh, uh, for more questions. But let me just mention one example of sort of the opposite impact that the law can have. Uh, and that is that uh, uh, earlier in uh, uh, this decade, one of the things that uh, 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 we found was that Connecticut utilities uh, were actually selling off watershed land. Uh, so this would seem to be particularly uh, uh, troublesome. Uh, and the question was why that was, well, it was because of the public utility regulation uh, there. Most of these water utilities were private. Uh, they got their, uh, uh, their uh, revenue uh, in a very traditional public utility fashion of having a rate base times the rate of return. And the land was valued at its original cost uh, for these uh, uh, utilities. Um, so that they weren't benefiting from the current economic value uh, uh, of that particular uh, land. And so they had an economic incentive to try to sell the watershed land in order to actually gain the appreciated value of it. And interestingly enough, the public utility favored this because what the public utilities wanted to do was actually to keep the rates as low as possible. Uh, and so they were frequently making deals with the utilities where if they sold the land, this appreciated value would be split. Part of it would go to the owners of the utilities, the shareholders of the utility. The other half would go towards actually decreasing uh, the uh, rates uh, that the consumers were, uh, were paying. So I mention this only because uh, if we really want to promote these types of, uh, uh, of markets, one of the things that we want to, uh, uh, to do uh, is to make sure that the incentives are correct. Uh, and that frequently requires us not only to think in terms of the type of incentives created by, say, the Safe Drinking uh, Water Act, uh, but also even look at things such as the, uh, uh, the system uh, by which the, uh, uh, the profits of the particular uh, entity uh, are, uh, uh, are created. So let me, I'm just going to jump through this. I'm just going to jump to the final um, uh, point, which is again, that I think actually one of the real benefits of the concept of ecosystem services uh, can be uh, helping to define and monitor uh, the protective measures that, uh, uh, that we might take. Um, just to give some examples of that, we have a variety of cap and trade systems. So we have a variety of wetland uh, banks. And actually thinking about wetland trades, permitting people to destroy some wetlands in return for restoring or protecting other wetlands, we need a mechanism for actually comparing the value uh, of those wetlands. What the concept of ecosystem services permits us to do is to now have a currency. Uh, and we don't even have to get to economic value here. But it would now have a currency that we can use to actually compare uh, those types of uh, uh, those wetlands. Um, similarly, at the federal level, you have the Government Performance Review Act of 1993, which requires agencies like EPA to actually evaluate how effective their regulations are working. Uh, concept of Ecosystem Services provides us uh, with a better mechanism than we've had before under GIPRA uh, to actually think about how you measure and determine uh, the effectiveness uh, of, uh, uh, of particular regulatory measures. And then finally, one question I'll just sort of pose is the degree to which we should actually begin thinking about incorporating the idea of ecosystem services uh, into various planning uh, processes uh, that we utilize. Uh, so for example, environmental impact reports under the 
uh, California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, or take natural community conservation planning that right now is limited primarily to focusing on biodiversity protection. Should we also be thinking when we require communities to engage in uh, NCCP planning to think not only about biodiversity but also to think about the ecosystem services that are generated by the land uh, in that particular uh, region. Uh, so I think there's a real benefit of ecosystem services in these various contexts. And these are ones that where it's uh, uh, still relatively uh, underutilized. Uh, One thing I'll just, and this is a huge table, so I'm not going to uh, go through it in detail. But what this basically was, was uh, an early attempt about three years ago uh, to map out um, lands, uh, in this particular case, in the central coast of California. Uh, and to look to see what services were produced by various parcels of land. Uh, and the important table is this table up here, table A, uh, which looks at the correlation of uh, what type of services were provided by a particular piece of land. Uh, so uh, uh, in particular, for example, you know, there's some correlation between those lands that provide carbon storage as a service and that also provide recreational services. Um, a even higher correlation between those that provide carbon storage and that also provide uh, water flow. But what's interesting here, of course, is that there's different levels of correlation. And in some cases, there's actually negative correlation. Uh, that by protecting a particular parcel of land, uh, you might get more of one ecosystem service, but you might very well get less of a different ecosystem service. Um, which means that we can't rely upon ecosystem services to simply assume that for protecting a particular piece of land, we're going to get more of everything. And it gets us all the way back to those trade-off questions uh, that we were facing earlier when we had to try to put an economic value uh, on uh, the services themselves. So unfortunately, although I'd love to think that we could get away from the valuation effort, to deal with these sort of trade-offs, I think inevitably, uh, you have to go back to valuation. So anyway, those are a whole variety of points. As I say, it's in some ways, it's sort of a meditation on, uh, uh, on ecosystem services and the way in which they might actually play into the protection of watersheds, either by providing additional justification uh, as by building a market case uh, for the protection of watershed land, or by helping us to define and then monitor uh, uh, the effectiveness uh, of particular uh, 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 protective uh, or managerial measures. So with that, we have like about uh, 10 minutes uh, left, 15 minutes left, and I would be glad to take more questions. Yeah. So a hypothetical question. Uh, say a new administration is elected in uh, what is it, eight months? That's right. Uh, well, certainly a new one of some sort will you be elected. Uh, you were asked to take an executive role in EPA, mm -hmm. larger role. What would be the first uh, changes in regulation that you would propose to uh, incorporate existing services in EPA regulation? I think that the, that, the, uh, that the most valuable thing here um, gets back again to uh, that last rule. Um, I'm not somebody who, you know, if you, if you think about the various roles, I'm actually somewhat doubtful uh, about uh, how important being able to put a value on the ecosystem services and show uh, OMB or others that indeed these are quite valuable. Not clear that that has great consequence. I'm somewhat doubtful of how far we're going to be able to push markets, both for some of the reasons that I mentioned and also because with the exception of carbon sequestration, you're talking about uh, very localized, uh, highly individualistic markets. And so 
uh, you have to spend a lot of money to get each of those individual markets going. Uh, so instead, I think it actually does go back uh, to thinking about how through regulations uh, you can actually uh, better define what it is that you're trying to achieve uh, by thinking in terms of ecosystem services. So again, for example, under the Clean Water Act and wetlands protections, uh, uh, saying that uh, as you make determinations which wetlands to protect, what type of trade-offs to permit, that you want to measure that in terms of ecosystem services. I think that that last uh, benefit is the greatest and that again, there's a lot of opportunity still within EPA uh, to move in that direction. Yeah. My experience is that lawyers talk in terms of certainties and scientists talk in terms of uncertainties. Yeah. And ecosystem science is subject to much greater uncertainty than engineering or other areas of science. So you talked tonight about uh, communicating with the public and asking them to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about um, making decisions based upon predictions of ecosystem services that would come out of ecological models. How does uncertainty figure in here? And does it parallelize the process? Or does it uh, lead you to identify areas where more research is needed to define the options available to people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a, I think that's both a fair uh, commentary on, on lawyers uh, and, and also uh, an excellent question. Uh, you're absolutely right that there's significant uncertainty uh, here, and furthermore, uh, we tend frequently to uh, disguise uh, that uh, uncertainty. Uh, uh, we find that actually, even in the, uh, uh, going back, for example, to the regulatory impact assessments I was talking about at the very outset, um, the analyses of, of uncertainty that take place as part of that tend to get relegated to appendices uh, and uh, uh, they, they generally uh, are not uh, surfaced. Uh, I think we have to do a much better job of not only looking at the uncertainties but actually uh, publicizing uh, those uncertainties, making the uncertainties clear. I actually don't think that the uncertainties in this area are much greater than the uncertainties that you find in a variety of other uh, environmental uh, contexts. Uh, the problem, of course, is if decision makers are told about the uncertainty, will they use that as an excuse for not acting? And what you would like to be able to pull off is that uh, you know, simultaneous thing of both providing more information about uncertainty so that the decision makers are aware of it. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, urging the decision makers to move forward, even in the face of that uncertainty, because you have to still make a decision, uh, even though the uncertainty is, uh, uh, is present. Um, I don't think that's particularly satisfactory. Uh, it isn't a satisfactory answer to your question. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, again, I think, you know, for me, the key thing is, again, not to, not to disguise it, uh, uh, to make it relatively uh, uh, clear, and then to educate decision makers on the importance of moving forward, even in the face of that uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, I have a question on the citizen jury. Concept. Yeah. Uh, is, and I understand that psychological economics or, you know, the look of the psychotic people making economic decisions uh, is really enormously irrational and very much influenced by the context of the information that they're given. So I presume that when you're when using a citizen jury, that that's somehow accounted for or taken into account. Uh, I just wondered if you had a comment on that. But yeah. Yeah, the nudge theory of economics. Right. Well, so, so I guess uh, you know, the one thing I would complain about is, is the use of the term uh, irrational. Uh, I'm not sure that, that uh, the fact that uh, by framing uh, the question in different ways, you're getting a different answer, uh, is saying that uh, what, you, what you're seeing there is irrationality well, on the part of the jury members. The that they, you know, among several studies, that if you give people 
if you have people write down their social security, the last two digits of their social security number, and then they make a choice. If their social security number is high, it correlates with their answer, and if it's low, I mean, it does, okay. in terms of those kinds of things, people are quite suggestible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so again, I guess, you know, the, the question, uh, you know, becomes whether or not um, when the, the problem that you have with the law of the environmental goods is that you're dealing with uh, 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 goods that, number one, are relatively complex, uh, and second of all, that people haven't thought about uh, uh, very much, right? Uh, and uh, it's in those contexts that psychologists uh, have uh, shown uh, that people are most suggestible because it's not something that they're used to, well, uh, used to doing. So that might be the place where you might have the most question about a contingent valuation uh, approach. To the degree that the problem is not so much one of, uh, of uh, irrationality, um, as it is that when people are dealing with an unfamiliar good or service that they've never been asked and thought about valuing in the, uh, uh, in the past, that an answer that they will give you initially might very well be influenced by the framing of their social security number, so they start thinking in terms of large numbers or small numbers. Citizen juries should actually help to uh, decrease uh, the problems that you're presented by, because rather than asking people, giving them information and asking them to provide you with uh, an immediate answer, you're actually forcing them to deliberate uh, over time uh, with a variety of other individuals and looking at a broad set uh, of, uh, uh, of information. So I haven't seen a study uh, that looks at the degree to which citizen juries are influenced by uh, writing down their social security numbers at the beginning of a session compared to contingent valuation, but my guess is, is that they're probably less influenced by that. Now, there could be other problems of group dynamics uh, that you also have to worry about at that particular stage, and one of the things that we should do to the degree that uh, the idea of a citizen valuation jury is appealing is we need far more uh, information as to the nature of the potential biases and how you can uh, address them. Um, there are very few studies of citizen juries used for valuation purposes. Fair number used for direct decision making, very few for valuation. So this is an area that would uh, benefit from uh, significant study. Okay, probably time for one or two more questions. Right there and then Joe. Yeah. Um, I lived in a community in Mexico where we um, down You know, so, so I didn't mean to, to suggest that, um, that in thinking about uh, the benefits of a particular protective measure, uh, that you should separate out the ecological benefits and the human health benefits. Because as you point out, they could frequently be highly intertwined. Uh, but there is a quite well-developed literature on uh, economic valuation of health benefits. Similarly, probably uh, for something in the nature of, um, uh, what would you say, three or four decades now, 
there's been work both between uh, health experts and economists so that the health experts are able to come up uh, with measures of the health benefits that economists can then value. So that it's fairly easy for EPA to carve out uh, one set of, uh, of benefits and put a value on them because there's been significant uh, work in that particular uh, area. Whereas when you look at things that look more like a pure ecological uh, value, EPA doesn't have the same set uh, of tools uh, available. But that's really a construct of the type of studies that have been done rather than necessarily a natural division. So does your, does your concept of services would that include um, protecting people from drought and other sorts of things, which would eventually sort of in a back way define what a healthy watershed is? Yes, uh, is the answer to that question. Okay, Joe. I don't exactly have a question. I have a kind of footnote. Okay. Uh, I just want to make a, a comment, mm -hmm. and that is that, you know, um, in addition to those things we can monetize or value, in addition to those things where we could where we can somehow elicit what public opinion is by one of the various mm -hmm. methods you talk about, it's important to remember that. We can't really know the future. And if you look back, um, some of the most important decisions we made in the area of resource and environmental action were the result of leadership at a time when there, wasn't, there was no public opinion. I mean, if you think Yellowstone, if you think the Grand Canyon dams, if you think of the Wilderness Act, I mean, um, some of those things, you know, mm -hmm. in my own lifetime, I mean, there was virtually no significant public support for those things. Uh, uh, but we did, we're grateful in retrospect that people who had, there were people who had vision who were able to somehow persuade decision makers. It wasn't. And what, you know, it wasn't in violation of democratic precepts, but you know that's also a, a piece of this puzzle. And I don't think in the efforts, I mean, I think are very important mm -hmm. that you're describing to try to value and understand these things. That that we we shouldn't forget that yeah. there's also a role for what you might call vision, right? And vision that relates to not just technical or scientific uncertainty, but the fact that you know we're going to see a lot of things differently 50 or 100 years from now yeah. than we see them now, even with our best efforts. And to think about people like John Muir, and think about the fact that we passed the Wilderness Act in 1964, mm -hmm. you know, and to think about what public opinion was about these things back then. You know, it was, it was a, the tiniest fraction of the yeah, yeah, yeah. care about those things. Yeah. So it's just a comment, by the way. But I think that's an important uh, footnote. And let me just say two or three things, in, uh, uh, not in response to it, but uh, in, in support of it. Which is the first thing is, is that you go back to the first argument for uh, potential benefit of the concept of ecosystem services, which is to provide additional justification. Um, I think there's a real question that if what we are looking for is additional justification, we are, we are more likely to find it in various ways of visualizing uh, and envisioning the environment versus in terms of uh, economically valuable services. Uh, so that's just a question of where we should be actually putting uh, the focus. Uh, the second one, one of the reasons I brought this uh, uh, slide up uh, is just some questions as to the degree in which we either promote markets and ecosystem services or we put a lot of focus on ecosystem services, that there are potential uh, negative uh, side effects, um, which I would include in that possibility of biasing conservation measures because you then begin focusing on those things that you actually can value uh, as ecosystem uh, services. As we saw earlier right now because of uh, uh, of 
the limited ability of economists to measure some things. We can't measure everything. And also, I'll just throw in the question of overjustification, uh, which is a psychological concept that uh, to the degree you pay people to do something which um, they should be doing on their own, that you might actually, in some cases, uh, make them less likely to do it. Uh, because they stop to ask themselves, well, if you're having to pay me to do something, then maybe it's not quite as valuable as I thought it was. Well, an interesting question whether you might get something in the nature of over-justification here, that too much focus on ecosystem services might actually undermine uh, uh, the, uh, the, the public benefit. So these are questions that I think need to be uh, addressed uh, and looked at more closely. So that, thank you. <laughs>